Good evening, everybody, and it's great to be with you. Advocate Batoy, very welcome. So I greet you all in the spirit of Lillian Ngoy, in the spirit of Sophie De Brain, Helen Joseph, Rahima Musa. These are the warriors of 1956 on whose shoulders we walk. And I thought I would just share with you that gorgeous picture of Sophie De Brain in the Sunday Times today. I want to know her secrets to look that good. Um, and she's the most fantastic Shira of all of ours. So I also greet you in the spirit of Tlaleng Mofokeng, the UN special, special rapporteur on gender-based violence, Shoma Josi, Pumzile Mlambo Nuka, Lindiwe Mazibuko, Sitembile Mbete, Lebo Mashile, fabulous women who own their space, and of course the national prosecutor, Shamila Batoe. Welcome. Thank you very much for being with us today. I'm very happy to be with you. Can everybody hear you? I can't hear you. Are you unmuted? Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. No, no problem at all. Lovely to be with you this evening. So I know Wonderful that today's... to be with you and your listeners as well. Thank you so much. So I know that this is a Women's Day webinar, and I want to stay true and authentic to that purpose because we have a war on women to talk about and so many other things. But I did want to share with you that almost all the questions we received, and we got written questions, and you'll also see from our chat in a few minutes, it's all about orange overall. So I guess we'll have a few minutes to get to that. But I wanted to ask you um, a question. One gentleman emailed me, and in the instructional way that some men can sometimes speak to women, he said, don't let her get away, get time frames. So what struck me beside that was how much, uh, what struck me and resonated with me was the utter desperation that you see almost everywhere in our society. It's almost... Um, the same debate that people in Lebanon and Beirut are having where corruption feels so, it's, it feels almost unbeatable. And I'm wondering how you deal with that and do you feel that sense of pressure a lot? I promise this is going to be a Women's Day webinar though. <laughs> with the way you started, I'm, <laughs> I hope so. I'm going no, no, to have my doubts about this because it is such an important issue. And, I, and of course, corruption is, is uh, you know, I don't need to tell people listening in how important that is. But I would be very sad if, if this particular, um, you know, event today um, is sort of overtaken by that, because we will then really not be recognizing the, the other pandemic that we're facing. And, you know, you mentioned Dr. Pumzile Mlambo Nguka, the executive director of yeah. UN Women in the list that you mentioned. Uh, our former deputy president of South Africa, and she characterized violence against women and girls as a shadow pandemic. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, war on women. And, you know, our constitutional court has even sa said, you know, the scourge is reaching alarming proportions in our country. Yes. So, you know, of course, we can we can talk some a, a little bit about that. But I really think this is, as you said, it's a war on women. Sure. And, and we really have to, you know, of course, there's many other platforms where I speak about corruption and I'm, I'm happy to, to do that. You know, I'm, we're not running away from that, not by any means. But what we are, we really have to understand that as a society, as not just South African, but globally, um, we're facing a war against women and girls and children. And, and our, our responses are, you know, are, are you know, just not sufficient. And I think we really need to dwell on those issues and sure. really seriously think about how far we've come, you know, since mm. Beijing Platform for Action way back, it's the 25th anniversary uh, this year. You know, we've had Security Council Resolution 1325 20 years ago on women, peace and security. And, you know, what have we achieved in all mm. of this time? Uh, and where are we now? I'm not, I, I certainly wasn't trying to ambush you, just to ask about, do you feel that utter pressure? But I, I'll come back to that. So I did well, want to I, ask you I, about- I should, A quick answer to that is yes. <laughs> I'm quite sure you do. <laughs> you were relating how, how today has gone. It hasn't been a public holiday or a, a day of rest not for you. But let's let's deal with the, the binary of being a woman in South Africa, where 
we have this constitution that has enabled many of us, but not enough of us, to realize every possible dream that has built a foundation of empowerment that is recognized around the world. But yet, on the other hand, we do live with this war on women where being completely unsafe in every sphere is part of a lived experience that's absolutely extraordinary, but also um, ex extremely dysfunctional. So I saw Karina Kutsia, one of the prosecutors, quoted in the Sunday Times today, and I was quite happy to see that, that your prosecution levels of gender-based violence crimes, and that goes all the way from sexual harassment through to rape, uh, through to the murder of women, the gendered murder of women, your numbers are quite high. And I wondered if you could share with us some of that, because it did leave me feeling like, oh, gosh, thank God something's happening here. The numbers are very high, really very high. I mean, we and, and you know, during lockdown, the first three weeks of lockdown, there were there were about 120,000 victims that called the South African National Helpline for gender based violence. Look, not all of them were related to gender based violence sure. calls for help, but certainly a large percentage of that was. And, you know, if we look at our statistics for just assault against women, you know, we had 82,726 um, in 2018-19, and that increased in in, in the 2019-20 period yes. by um, about 500. We've got sexual offences that are, you know, 52,000 in the one year. Uh, rape has increased uh, by 1.7% from 40, over 41,000 to um, 40, just slightly, but to about 42,000 uh, in, in the following year. And, and you know, we've, we've in the past, um, you know, that we've got there's so many initiatives, but if you look at these statistics, it is really scary. I think the statistics is two women, seven women and two children, and this is not SGBV, are killed every day. Every day. And, you know, this is, you know, it is a war when you have seven women and two children dying every day. Then we have to really question what is going on in our country when, when the levels of violence against women and children, and we won't even talk about the general levels of crime in this country, is just so high. And uh, yeah, so that is the reality as far as statistics oh. is concerned. But I must add that, you know, in the courts, uh, you said, you know, one of the prosecutors spoke today, yes. we have really good conviction rates in the sense that, you know, it's about uh, 70 to 80 percent, you know, conviction rate. In in the year 2000, we had a 48 percent conviction rate. That increased to about 60 percent in 2010, and now it's sitting around 75 percent. But that conviction rate, and this is important, is based yes. on the number of cases that come to court, not on the reported number cases. And what's the difference it, between those two? Huh? These are very important statistics because. The number of reported and our crime stats were released just recently. Yes. So the number of reported, the conviction rate vis-a-vis -vis the reported cases is 10.5% for rape and 9.2% for sexual assault. So oh. the difference is it's when you compare how many convictions do you have as when compared to the reported crimes, as opposed to those that ultimately are detected and get onto the court rules. Once it gets onto the court rules, we have a 75%, but it's the detection rate and what actually gets onto the court rules that stands at around 10%. And if you add to that underreporting, we know that globally um, is vast underreporting with regard to sexual offenses. The real, the percentage of how many victims of rape and other sexual assault actually get justice at the end of the day is even less than 10%. And, and that do you is think that, that figure of one in nine rapes actually being reported, do you think that's still correct? That's one we used as young, young activists, or do you think that the years of democracy have brought that down or made it worse? I mean, just a scan of the media will suggest to you it's, it's worse, but I'd love to know what the, the, the actual rates are, are telling you and what your view is. I don't have the actual statistics now, but it's 
I wouldn't be surprised if it's still around that rate. The underreporting is extremely high. And, you know, if you put that all into the, into the pot, um, victims or survivors of rapes and sexual assaults, the vast majority don't receive justice for various reasons. And that, that picture has to change. Does that keep you up at night? And what's happened since you came in? I know that your part, the way you can impact is a small part. But if you could just paint for us along the continuum, what are, how, where is there light at the end of the tunnel? Do you see reporting being uh, a more effective process than it used to be? Just last week, I read about a woman who had reported her abusive partner. A cop dropped her back home and said, oh, you must make right at home. And too often do we, uh, do we hear of these kinds of cases. You know, uh, Ferial, the, it is so important that, you know, in order to, to try to uh, address this from a reactive perspective, because as you know, the criminal justice system comes in after the crime's been committed. And there's a, there's a whole lot that needs to happen proactively that I do want to touch on, because that is something that, that is, you know, it's, it's a, what is happening is a reflection of what is going on in our society. So sure. a, an effective criminal justice system is really important. It plays a really crucial role in trying to serve as a deterrent. And as you know, you know, people have said, you know, one of the most effective deterrents to any crime is the certainty of detection and that there will be a solid investigation and a prosecution. Now, when you look at the figures, there's no certainty about that at all. And so, you know, there's been a lot that's going on in the criminal justice system, but still, there's, there's so much more that needs to happen. Within the NPA, we are doing, you know, we, we are part of the emergency response action plan, plan of the president. We've prioritized these matters of uh, SGBV and femicide. We are looking at, you know, training of the prosecutors. We have the Tutuzela Care Center model, which is regarded as an international best practice yes. in terms of how we deal with sexual and gender-based crimes holistically. You know, it is victim-centered. Uh, victims that come here, they receive, you know, lots of support services that are necessary. Um, you know, we have prosecutor guided investigations. And so the, I don't want to go into the detail of the kind of services they provide, but that's the first step. But once, once, once those that are violated come into the system, it is really important that all criminal justice professionals in the system, you know, whether they are the prosecutors, the defense, the magistrates, the judges, Everybody needs training in the social context and understanding the gender perspective and understanding the trauma, understanding secondary victimization, because it isn't it doesn't help if you have just one or two aspects of the system that are focusing on this and that the others are not. Because when a, when a victim comes into the system, she looks at the entire system and and, you know, I have to I have to concede that. That you know our systems are failing. Uh, you know some of our, our some of those that actually do think you know do decide to come and, and approach the system and try to get justice um, because there's there's a lot that needs to be done in in this field. So you know we with the Tutuzela care centers, as I said, they are international best practice. We are we are developing a gender 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 policy. We've just started that now. Uh, which looks at how we will, you know, really deal more effectively with gender-based violence. We are working with our, our colleagues in the SAP, South African Police Service. I've had meetings with the National Commissioner, um, and we've had other meetings at a more technical level where we are looking at trying... One of the major challenges is really dealing with the forensic evidence and, you know, having sufficient crime kits so that you can collect the evidence. And... And, you know, having them tested in, in the labs. And so, you know, we are looking at a backlog project. We are trying to, you know, collect a whole lot of cold cases where forensic evidence was not available at the time. We are trying to fast track uh, to look at cases that had been withdrawn because of forensic evidence not being available at the time or delays with getting it and trying to actually ensure that these cases are brought back onto the role and that those victims still get justice. So. There's a lot that, that's happening even with the emergency response action plan, as I said, which is being led by the presidency. But this is reaction. And when you look at proactively, what needs to happen in our society 
you know, what is going on when, when, what are the kinds of values that we are, we are teaching our children, you know, schools and universities need to come on board. What are we teaching our young people when, when they can actually violate and the values by which they live are, are just, you know, it, it talks to violence and disrespect for not just women, but for other human beings. Sure. So, they really need I to guess those are a, 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 a societal response but I think from many of the questions and I'm, I'm you'll just see me looking I'm going to start reading uh, them so welcome Zahira Larry Kramer uh, Glenn Bossman I'm going to ask a question from Florencia Belvedere welcome what's been done to ensure that the entire criminal justice value chain is improved and the relationship interaction between police prosecution courts prisons you start speaking about us I'll, I'll do a few Shamila at the same time uh, from no, Arvin no. Naik um, gender violence and corruption is killing our country does the NPA have enough muscle to fight the scourge many questions came in this afternoon and to, to, uh, tonight about whether you have the right skills and enough people um, um, from Bernie Radomsky what can be done to change the culture of men as regards women I think that's a societal question as you said um, uh, from Viva Rattle it's absolutely essential we find a way to teach our boys and men to honor and protect women and girls big messaging about that from our president from Daniela Kruger a uh, big up for you but toy will bring credibility back to the NPA um, and then Michelle Posma not so great it all sounds like the consumer protection all talk but absolutely no bite then a question from Graham Turnbull and I'll stop here the level of corruption in our country has affected the position of women in society and their vulnerability they experience due to poverty um, a discussion on corruption and the link to gender-based violence are surely linked and should be a topic in this webinar and you said as much as well as about when you wrote in the Guardian last month um, about the extreme challenges posed to uh, women um, by the pandemic. That's a mouthful, mm -hmm. I know, but I think you've I know it's the a mouthful, and I, I wasn't <laughs> writing everything. I should yes. have been writing no, I'll remind but you if you don't. Yeah. Now, let, let me start. You know, I don't be, blame people for, uh, for saying it's all talk and no action. You know, yes, I, I, I yes. don't blame people for saying that because look at where we are. So, you know, within the criminal justice system, and I think that was your, your first question, we are, you know, there's, there's. Firstly, it is a, it is a priority in our strategy. It is, it, it is a priority in all the director of public prosecutions divisions um, throughout the country. Um, and you know, we have developed a, a training module um, as part of the advanced sexual offences training curriculum, which deals with, you know, all aspects of, you know, context sensitivity, uh, awareness in prosecutorial dis decision making. And you know we we continuously update is this that manual. Is all in pilot, or is it rolled out to your entire service? No, no, no. That service so? rolled out throughout the entire service. Okay. This is being updated. It is it is it is what has been happening for a number of years. The NPA established the Sexual Offences and Community Affairs Unit uh, some years back, about twenty years ago, yes. and this unit. That is the Tutuzela Care Centers was actually set up in the context of this unit in the NPA, which, as I said, is an international best practice in terms of support to women. But we've also been, you know, part of deliberated in the process of legislative amendments uh, to the Criminal Procedure Act, the Domestic Violence Act, um, and and there's been a, a number of. In fact, there were just legislative amendments that were passed just last week um, relating to sexual yes. offences. And, and so there's a lot that's going on in this space uh, in terms of enhancing. And if you just look at the, the conviction rates of what actually comes into the prosecution space at 75% means there's a lot going on. And I also have some statistics on, on the sentences that are being meted out yes, uh, by, by, mm -hmm. by the courts. And so if you, if you look at you know, the number of accused receiving sentences for either life imprisonment or terms of imprisonment of between 20 and 25 years has been steadily increasing. In 2018-2019 financial year, of the 1,774 accused um, that were convicted, 
um, around just over 25% of them received these long sentences. In the 2019-2020 financial year, uh, there were that rose to 28.5%, so just under a third of those receiving life imprisonment or long terms of between 20 and 25 years. And then even as we come down, there's a large percentage that received between 10 and 20 years imprisonment. So the thing is, the criminal justice system, although I acknowledge right from the outset, there's there's a lot that needs to happen because the detection rate is low. Yes. But once, once they enter the justice system, the prosecutors are trained. We are getting a, a conviction rate of 75%. We're getting high sentences being imposed. But at the end of the day, it's not an effective deterrent. These The, the violations are still going up. So, you know, the question is, it has to be seen in the, the rea so the reactive part of it is, 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 although it's not perfect, they, you know, at 75% conviction rate, that's a really good stat. But when you look at the reported cases, the detection, what's happening in society, why is that going on? Then you really have to look beyond the criminal justice system to look at how we address the scourge. So, you know, in terms of, um, the last question relating to, um, you know, many of the questions related to the criminal justice system and what we're doing. And Ferio, you're about, do, you, uh, do you work together with the police? Do you have those um, prosecution led investigations, for example? We work very closely with the police. Um, and, you know, the, the prosecutors on the ground at a highest level with, with the national commissioner, we have been working very, very closely with them. But the one thing we do need to work on in the criminal justice system is, is trying to increase the detection rate and trying to increase the number of cases that actually do come, do go to trial. That that amount of 10% is is seriously concerning. Is that and because so, you know, people are dropping cases or because the detection is just so appalling the case built to bring to you to the npas is poor it doesn't stand up in court or are people dropping case uh, dropping charges um early in the process you know a, a large percentage of it is is because we don't get the evidence that we need to proceed oh. um and and that is the challenge and what is also concerning is that you know the research has shown that a large percentage of the perpetrators of these offences are often known to the victim, either yes. an acquaintance, a, a friend, a family member, um, you know, a, a relative, um, and and not just when it comes to children. The percentage is higher when it comes to children, but when it comes to all um, uh, victimizations, it is a high percentage of people that are known to the to the victims. And so, you know, when you look at that, um, I, I want, you know, the stigmatization, you know, but this goes to reporting means, and the various other reasons why women don't come forward. Lack of yeah. confidence in the system itself is one of those reasons. But, you know, when you look at the fact that many of the perpetrators are known, you, you begin to think then, why is this so low? Why are the percentages so low? Why are we not able to get the evidence that we need to bring these cases to court? And in terms so that of, sorry, there was a question around the link between uh, particularly COVID-19 now and and corruption and the impact yes. on women. Um, I can't I can't agree more with the person who raised that question. The the impact of corruption generally on women, because we we know that you know uh, as a result of corruption, there have been many. Um, uh, many interventions in terms of providing basic services that, you know, money has been stolen. So, you know, basic services like water, sanitation, etc., has not been provided. And so the, the impact on women as, as generally as a caregiver in the family, but also on those women that are trying in the informal sector has been huge. And when you look at the COVID-19 impact, um, you know, we were in our discussions uh, in, in, in government in trying to address, um, you know, the response to, to COVID-19 generally and to corruption in particular. I know the Department of Women was looking at, at a gender analysis, doing a gender analysis in terms of looking carefully at what is the impact 
of COVID-19 in particular on women so that the interventions that are put in place can actually talk directly to that as a result of a comprehensive gender analysis. So there are things that are happening in government to address this issue in particular. I think it's it's very, it's very slow because you've seen this around the world, in the UK, everywhere, where they're calling this a, a she session because the impacts on women's employment, women in informal sectors are, are quite clear. But I do want to go on because many people really lovely questions and comments. I'll give you a few more from Joan Fanike. Very little funding going into primary prevention and Joan should know her story. Um, mm -hmm. from, from Viv Gostert, I'm concerned, but we'll get to those in a moment. I just go a little bit further down. Um, Denise Huxham, underreporting because victims fear the process. We spoke a little bit about that. Um, and then many more. So what I do want to ask you as someone who's followed those Tutuzela care centers very, very carefully through the years, they seem to have fallen victim to the same kind of hollowing out of your institution that we saw through the kleptocratic years where they were defunded or underfunded. And really, you didn't have your top people running that part of the NPA. Um, how have you improved um, those things? And has some of the 1.5 additional, 1.5 billion additional budget you got, has it gone into ensuring that we have the right kind of prosecutorial talent to, to prosecute the war on women? Because I do think when you start seeing those big sentences coming through and the, uh, uh, the big rings being cracked, it has an impact of making one as a woman in our country feel safer. Um. Yeah, Ferial, on, on the Tutuzela Care Center model, um, yes. that has, there are many of them that are working extremely well, but there are some yes. of them that do have challenges. And what we have actually found is that the system lacked a national coordination structure. Okay. So what, what we have just put in place, in fact, being put in place at the moment, is a national Tutuzela Care Coordination Center. And, and we are also together with um, UNODC looking at doing an evaluation of each one of the centers so that we can you know, have, a, have a good understanding because there are many of them that are working well, but there are some of them that actually need assistance. And what's the, what's the UNODC just to tell us? Yeah. Office for Drugs and Crime. Okay, so, thank you. So the, 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 the problem with the... Um, the Tutuzela care centers is that because you have, um, it's a multidisciplinary approach, um, the hollowing out, as you said, has had an impact on this because getting the right skills, they are not just from prosecutors, but from all of the, the, the other support services. And at this point, I must really acknowledge the work of various other entities like the Department of Health, like the Department of Social Development and various NGOs that are actually providing a lot of services at these Tutuzela care centers that support the victims and survivors of these crimes. And so I think the most important thing is the evaluation and then the national structure that is going to actually look at each, at a look holistically at what is working, what is not working, and give the impetus from a national level to ensure that we engage with the relevant departments, with NGOs, and we make sure that the centers are working optimally as they need, as they should be. There are 55 sites, and it's envisaged that there will be another, I think it's seven more that will be created within this. Uh, and when do you expect? When do you expect that to be finished? Because I've watched you carefully, not in a stalky way, but just because I'm interested in the rebuilding of the institution. Is When do you expect that work to be finished? Because I think that you go for the polished final perfect product and it can sometimes take a little bit long. So when at least will that diagnostic be done? I, I hear what you're saying, you know, yeah, they say what they say, perfection is the enemy of the good, you know. Yes. So, you know, we are, we are hoping, you know, that, you know, we must try for within the next six months to try to ensure that we have the evaluation done and certainly to have national structure also set up during that period. And it's say a year from now we do another one of these next year this time. I hope we will. Where do you where would you like things to be? I also would just like you to walk us through. Um, I, you know, our country is so 
there's such intense news all the time that we actually missed that the cabinet approved very important GBV bills, gender-based violence bills this week. Um, mm -hmm. Extremely important. There were criminal criminal law, uh, criminal law, amendment law amendments. Uh, the National Register will be changed. The Domestic Violence Amendment Bill will go before Parliament. Could you explain to us in a nutshell why these are important for us to know about? I think, you know, the, it, it actually, the fact that we need to to uh, boost our, you know, legislative um, response yes. to these these means that you know we've it, it recognizes that well it's a recognition by you know government that you know we need a more powerful legal framework. The fact of the, the register is a really really important issue because many people that have had uh, offenses, for example, for example, pedophiles were actually these registers were not available or they were available only in a very limited context so the fact that you know we we are going to this is going to be more available to certain other areas where people work particularly with children is a really important step in the right direction in terms of dealing with um the the violations against children so these are you know the Strengthening the legislative straight framework is part is one part of government's response to deal with holistically with the response. But as I said, these are all reactionary. And as Joan van Niekerk said, there's there's perhaps not enough that is being done at the preventative sure. side of it. Unless we focus on that, um, the prosecutors we have. You asked a question earlier. We have really well-trained prosecutors, prosecutors who do their jobs well. So from the NPA perspective, um, I feel confident that we do have the skills that we need. But the whole of government approach and the preventative side of it, that is where the key is going to lie. In one is prevention and two is better detection of these cases. So here's a lovely question from Sandy Shell. How much serious training in forensics and collection of evidence does our SAPs have? I know you're not in charge of the police service, but you'll have a sense. Uh, from Joan van Eekerk, again, we have two registers and they duplicate each other's. If we really want to protect women and children, we should be using the SAP 69 register. She says the National Sex Offenders Register is a waste of money. Barbara Castle, in a patriarchal patriarchal society such as ours, gender-based violence is unlikely to be on the decrease. Um, I have to hope that's not true. From Prof. Francis Wilson, the question of values takes us to the heart of the matter. We have to start there, given the fact that apartheid and, for example, the policy such as migrant labor that went with it was so totally immoral that there's little social consciousness of right and wrong. Where are the imams? Where are the rabbis? Where are the priests in this debate? What effective steps are the churches, the mosques, the synagogues taking to teach crash courses on values? Is that the kind of thing you you were speaking about advocate Batoy. you know exactly and i think you know what the sad thing about you know most you know the spiritual you know the last the values issue which which yes it's you know it it actually lies also in you know it starts off with the family but of course all of the the religious institutions have a have a really important role to play in that but I think what, what is becoming sad is that, you know, it, with religions, and I'm, and I'm not all religions or most religions, people are focusing on just doing, you know, sort of certain, you know, um, you know, there are certain practices that people just, it's the values, you know, the philosophy behind the religions that are being lost. So, you know, so people think if I go to a mosque or I go to a temple or I go to a church, um, on a particular day of the week and I pray and I do all of that. So we do all of those practices. People have a lot of, but we are forgetting about what are the values behind these practices. And I think somehow it, it's our schools and our institutions, our universities have got to seriously think about changing the curricula in terms of what are we, I mean, if you think of, of people in, in society, most people, we are driven by, you know, the, the amount of money we earn, the cars we drive, the, the houses we live in, and all of those values, you know, we are not driven by values of respect for other people, 
treating people well, you know, gratitude. And so, you know, we really need to go back to inculcating those values. Then we will hopefully see that translating into us treating people better, whether it's about women and sexual violence or just crimes in South Africa in, in general. So, you know, I, I, you know, it will be good. I haven't, you know, Joan von Niekerke, we haven't spoken for years, but it will be certainly good to catch up and to hear her views on this. In terms of the training, uh, you know, SAPS, and SAP, there's ongoing training. I don't have the details of, of the SAPS training, but I know that there is ongoing training in the SAPS, but it's still, you know, a lot, a lot needs to be done. And I think our forensic uh, capabilities needs to be increased uh, to be strengthened considerably uh, because you know the forensic evidence is one of the most important um, uh, pieces of evidence in any trial so that that is hugely important the patriarchal uh, society yes I, I share your views Farrell I hope that that's not correct but I think it is a reality you know it is um, a lot of some of the the you know the the uh, violence against women are justified by custom and patriarchy and and you know as as mothers you know we have to really look at you know what role are we playing in bringing up our children with the right values to respect whether it's male or female um, to respect each other you know so that patriarchal society has a ha has a major impact unfortunately um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to to do something about that in terms of engaging more, you know, with and we are there's even within our criminal justice uh, cluster, we are engaging with with certain, you know, uh, community leaders to try to change this this type of attitude. So a lot of work needs to go in that space. So, so you're going to enjoy this comment from Lorene Platsky, who you may remember. How many perpetrators of GBV, that's gender-based violence, think even of the justice system when they beat and kill women and children and hang them from trees, that awful case we saw earlier this year. This is about patriarchy, power, entitlement to women's bodies and minds, often fueled by binge drinking. Um, Roshni Gajar, in a country where the ratio of males to females is relatively balanced, what systemic changes are needed to change the behavior to foster um, great, a far greater gender parity? Um, so Polly van Weyck, Paul Hoffman, the rest of you, I do see your questions and we definitely um, will get to them. But I thought those were interesting. Where do you stand on the alcohol ban um, in the country, which has emptied out the trauma units, but it's also such a key component of the gender-based violence that, that so corrodes our country? I think that's that's a really important issue. I mean, we 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 have, you know, there's there's statistics that show that when we had uh, the ban on alcohol, the the gender-based violence uh, drastically reduced. And you know, the, as a as a as a society, we have to look at. In fact, the National Commissioner of Police was just today in a meeting that we had earlier this morning, uh, talking yeah. about the fact that you know the 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 what we found is a learning from the COVID-19 is the connection between alcohol and domestic violence. I think there's been you know research done on that. People are aware of it, but it was stark in that we could see that numbers had come down. But so you know, with regard to you know, there's a number of legislative changes I think we also need to look at in terms of how people get licenses to sell alcohol. You know, you yes. have a to buy alcohol from from outlets close to schools, etc. So I feel very strongly that there needs to be a lot more um, enforcement or regulation in terms of alcohol licenses and in terms of how you know we can't be a nanny state. You know, so it's you know you people have you know you, you can't say okay we've got to ban alcohol. So you know. Because, you know, we're not a nanny state. People have rights, you know, and they're entitled. If people want to drink, they're entitled to drink. But how do you actually regulate? So, you know, and then we kind of go around in circles because that then circles back to the fact that we deal again with the values. And, you know, so the, the alcohol, the patriarchy and all of that and the lack of those values at an all feed into, um, you know, exacerbating the the violence against women and children so i think alcohol we really need to think about not just legislation 
but other ways in which we can regulate uh, the sale and consumption and use of alcohol so that you know it we can minimize the impact on women and children. Thank you. So from Tabi Lioka, the economist does Shamila trust the competency of the police? Police have been known to fluff cases and even hide files. We know that. What should be done to clean up the police? The same question applies with regards to the hawks. I know they're not your babies, but that is from Tabi. There have been many, many similar ones from uh, Beulah Tambudu. Not getting evidence is a SAPS failing. Can we not establish an alternative arresting authority through the Disaster Management Act or any legislation that so lends itself and put them all on Robben Island. Or that's what she said earlier in an email question. But you get the you you get the, the drift of what people are, are asking quite a lot of here. And you know, yeah, you know, the SAPS, the SAPS is is one of our key partners in 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 this fight against gender based violence and. You know, it's it's there, there are serious challenges in the SAPs, and and you know, I, I, you know, it's as I said, you know, we partners, we're working on this together. But I agree that you know there needs to be more training. We need to really look at, you know, the competency issues in, in not just in the SAPs, in 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 all criminal justice professionals. As I said, um, looking at you know the, you know, corruption in these in these law enforcement entities. Looking at, you know, the lack of um, you know, sometimes there's, there's, you know, lack of, you know, the understanding of, of the social context, the training with relate. You know, you gave an example earlier on when we started about a yes. woman going to a police station yes. and getting a certain type of, you know, response. And those are those are so important in their system to make sure that we have, you know, persons in, right? SEPS is the first line. There's a number of victims that don't go to the Tutuzela care centers. That actually go to the to the SAPs. And yes, so, and it's you know, often you have, appalling. <laughs> and and we have to have that kind of mental understanding of of you know a whole lot of gendered issues um, and you know relating to to gender based violence. And we've got to have the training. And I I think our system does fail many many victims who 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 expect certain who need certain types of services when they go to the SAPs and even when they when they come to the courts, if you have magistrates or or you know other criminal justice professionals who don't understand and you have the secondary victimization, it's hugely problematic. So you know we can certainly manage what's happening in the NPA space in, show, in terms of making sure we have the skills, we have the right attitude. Yes. In, I was at the International Criminal Court when I was there. I, I was part of uh, I led a team that developed the sexual and gender based violence policy for the office of the prosecutor of the ICC. And and that in itself was, you know, so we are now looking, um, you know, here in the NPA to develop that kind of policy so that, you know, we understand not just about how we prosecute these cases, but we understand how we engage with victims and then survivors of these crimes. That Good everyone must understand yeah. the gender perspective. What is a gender perspective? What is the lens through which we see these issues? So, you know, and, and having a gender perspective, it, it relates to, you know, it's important in so many different contexts, not just in terms of how we, we deal with victims or survivors or engage with victims or survivors of these crimes, but in terms of, you know, how you deal with staff, you know, how you recruit. And so it has, uh, you know, a multifaceted um, a impact. And so we're looking at developing this policy so that as, you know, certainly as the NPA, we have the right attitude, we have the right mm. skills in terms of dealing with this. But other professionals in the criminal justice system, I agree, there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done. A lot. So I want to uh, go back to something I said, I think you said at a, one of the Daily Maverick gatherings. Um, and I have a question related to this, which I ask with humility and respect. So you said the reality is if you want to bring a good corruption case the average internationally in developed jurisdictions is that it takes between six and nine years. It's not what we want to benchmark ourselves against, but it is the reality. Now, I, I, I want to ask you this one is, do you think that you do make perfect the enemy of the good? And many, many questions coming through about low hanging fruit which people believe you can pluck and so inculcate confidence in the system 
that corruption isn't going to ruin us. It's not going to make the war on women worse than it is. Um, do you think you could move a little bit faster? You know, I, I've I've often said, you know, I I, you know, these these cases, I take a long time. Yes, and I agree with everything you've said about the low hanging fruit. About, you know, if if anyone doesn't think that, you know, we are acutely aware of that, and that if these were just hanging there for the plucking, we yes. would take them, because, you know, we we you know I've come back to this country because this is our it's it's a calling it's what we want to do is to yes. to address corruption and so there's there's a number we are looking at you know a, a number of within you see the the investigating directorate that was set up is set up to deal with your high level corruption your state capture and can you imagine if the investigating directorate goes for the very low level cases people are going to say but you were you set up to do this but outside of the investigating directorate we're also dealing we have the sexual offenses uh, sorry the um we have the our commercial crime um units in the npa and we are working with the hawks in that space in tr in terms of trying to to address what people talk about low hanging fruit and so you know we we've, we've been working with general Libya in in terms of looking at more at dealing with for example contraventions of the uh, public service management act the Muni municipal services the mfma and pfma looking at you know uh, dealing with those um uh, statutory offenses um, looking at the less serious offenses so that we can, you know, I agree, you know, you need to get people out of the system. And so yeah. whilst we are trying to put together these very complex uh, corruption cases that that do take, um, you know, they take time. And and I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges in that regard with the ID in a minute. Uh, we do, we are looking at working, we're not looking at, we are working with SAPS to try to get together these other cases that can show the people that things are happening, that the wheels of justice are turning. And they I have wonder, been, look, there was the VBS um, you know, arrest. There was a big arrest yesterday with the OR Tambo, but it related to organized crime. A number of, many number, uh, I think it was um, 17 SAPS police officers were arrested. So there's a number of, there's a number of things that are happening uh, to try to inculcate that confidence. And I accept people are, People are tired of this, you know, but we are really trying to go after the low hanging fruit. And so hopefully in the, in the next couple of weeks, there will be some, you know, more action, you know, and that is why, you know, people want ask me why, you know, why am I not speaking more? You know, they, the media, I'm talking today primarily because it's a, it's a women's day issue, but it is my philosophy that our actions must speak louder than our words. And so it's so important what you're saying to get those smaller cases into the court whilst we, in parallel to that, look at building those those big cases. Yeah, I mean, when now, people ask that, they're asking about the big cases. And then there's a question I have to ask you because it's come up 20 times on the chat and then emailed about 10 times. And I get why it's a vital one. Um, so last week, Jacques Paul reported that since August last year, you've had this report on your desk drawn up by a crack team within your NPA that has pointed mm -hmm. alarming fingers and things that we've really known about um, Advocate Noko, who's now in the Northwest, and the Advocate Selo Maema, who's also in the Northwest. Shouldn't they have been part of your clear out, your broom cleaning, because you have brought in your own team who clearly are driving things. And I wonder if you could tell us when you're going to work on that. Because for me, that's treating the Northwest a little bit like a Bantustan, because it is yeah. a place of enormous corruption and misspending. Mm. You've only got to read the Auditor General's reports to see that. So I wonder if you could take us into your confidence about that. No, fine. I, I, sure, I'm going to try to take you in, into, um, you know, my confidence. Um, firstly, you know, I, let, let me clarify that, um, Advocate Noko was the DPP in just on on the Northwest issue, and yes. it seems like you know we are putting people there, and 
you know, you said it's been treated like a Bantustan. So people that have, you know, some kind of smoke around them or alleged allegations are put yes. into the Northwest. So firstly, Advocate Noko um, requested a transfer to the Northwest because as the DPP, because of family. And so that was why she was, there was no reason not to move her there. She was, she would have been doing the work in, in KZN. Now she was doing the work in the Northwest. As for Advocate Maema, and the media incorrectly reported that he was promoted. He was oh. not promoted. Advocate Maema has, has been a deputy DPP for a number of years. He was a deputy DPP in the Northwest. And he was brought to Pretoria to do certain certain work. Let me put it that way. And when I decided that, um, you know, I was going those um, prosecutors that were brought to the VGM head office to do certain cases, when I decided that they needed to go back and I was dismantling that capability, then Advocate Maima went back to the Northwest, which is his, that is station. Where he's he's from. Been there. That's yes. where he's from. He's been mm. there for a number of years. And so the media reports that he was promoted. I mean, that is completely mm. incorrect. What, what about was Advocate just Noko? Because I've been covering back. her for years and years and not in ways that give me confidence as a South African. So, you know, in that regard, you know, this is when I first took office, you know, um, it was about understanding what was going in the, on in the NPA and then um, you know, there were, and, and I'm going to, you know, this is about speaking about people that are still in the NPA. So I, I understand you know, are, we've got to be fair. Yes, exactly. So, I've, so let me just say this much that we, um, both those uh, against whom the allegations are leveled, as well as the institution, it's in the interest of all of us that there is a process that, you know, they can be cleared if they need to be cleared or if they are, have found to have acted improperly, then there must be consequences. And so there was, um, you know, a lot of um, consideration given to what exactly should that process be in terms of understanding what exactly happened. Now, a number of these decisions that you hear about, um, like, you know, I the report that was publicized, the one uh, relating to the Boysen matter, where I overturned the decision of, of to prosecute. Yes. Now, the, these are the subject of the Zondo Commission inquiry, and a lot of evidence is being led there about what exactly happened. And so we have been trying to work with the commission. If any, any um, process in the NPA would have been a parallel process, and there's no way you know, you cannot look at incidents in isolation. You've got to look at it in the broader context of what was going on. And in order to do that, it would mean that I would need to set up a mini Zondo commission in the, to, to look at this. When you have a commission where it has, and I will never be able to get a fraction of those resources to do and unearth what the Zondo commission is doing. They have a stream that is called the law, law enforcement um, state capture, state capture and law enforcement. And, you know, this is where all of that is located. And the commission has actually got to a point where they're analyzing all of that. And so I'm, you know, before, in fact, even before this was Jacques Pau's um, media report, yes. um, I was, in, we've had several engagements with the Zondo Commission in terms of how we could ensure that we get the, the evidence that they have without having to go through the same process. Um, and so I'm, I'm in the process of writing to Judge Zondo to, to in fact, um, try to fast track the findings with regard to the, to the law enforcement stream. You know, I mean, if we could get interim reports, they would be great because you cannot deal with this in a piecemeal manner. And so the report of the Zondo Commission is hugely important, but we can't wait for another year. And this is what is really you know, I'm really taking you into my confidence here. Yeah, sure. exactly. We cannot wait for another year to, to, to address these matters. And it has had a very negative impact both on the institution as well as people that are implicated. Because in fairness, as I said, when I started off, either way, it must be dealt with and put to bed. And so, you know, I'm hoping that we would be able to to reach some agreement, um, you know, to, to be able to get the findings of the Commission with well, regard well, to well, will the change of the regulations last week aid you in, in this way? Because I understand that it will or not really. 
Not for this particular purpose. Okay. The change of the regulations will assist the investigating directorate in so far as accessing information, etc., uh, with regard to um, you know certain certain cases. So it'll work there. But in this particular case, it's really about the commission has already collected a whole lot of evidence. Some are in the public domain, but not all. And they're in the process of analyzing that now and making submissions, etc. And, and that is, you know, we really need. Uh, the findings very, very quickly so that these matters can be addressed. We've got lovely questions. I'm just going to try and do a few in the, like, oh, one minute we have. <laughs> we have five minutes. Hasn't the Zondo Commission done a huge amount of work needed to bring about prosecutions? You've begun to answer that. Surely this should allow you to go after the high-hanging fruit, most of whom are obvious to us. Uh, my own question is one of the things I was really impressed with. I mean, I, I made a list of all the things that have happened. The global Mag Magnitsky law, now applicable to the Gupta family, regiments mm -hmm capital you've really taken uh, a billion rand in frozen assets quite huge the ANC MP and former state security minister Bongani Bongo case uh, um, uh, charges laid against them also against the EFF president Julius Malema and his deputy um, that's related to the just discharge of the rifle so it's not as if nothing's happened um, but I guess is how, how do you think we'll ever get the the big names um, the Guptas the former president, perhaps. What about those big names? Are those really difficult to do? I'm, I'm you know, I don't get involved in names because we sure. don't target people, you know, and I think it's unfair. Uh, but we we will go wherever the evidence takes us. And I feel confident that if the investigating directorate is properly resourced, that has been a major stumbling block because, you know, just the legal framework, which is based on a secondment model. Yes. Um, it's just not working because they, the, the, you know, it's based on a model where other uh, entities in government are meant to give them the uh, directorate resources to do this work. So that has been one of and the forensic capabilities, the, the challenges with forensic evidence, the skills that has been a major stumbling block with the ID. But I feel very confident that with the recent amendment to the to the Zonda Commission regulations, as well as the the recent indications that have emerged from from the the ANC NEC meeting, the cabinet statement that was made about the need to actually um, have a more robust response to dealing with corruption, I feel very confident if the necessary um, resource, and I feel confident now that there seems to be a bit of a change of the mood in terms of how we deal, there's, there's more of an urgency. I feel very confident that things are going to change and that the ID... Uh, the national mood is, 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 the national mood is, is almost, um, com it, it feels like it could explode any day. And I, I guess that's why there's all these questions to you. So the last one I did want to ask you, and I hope you can answer, is a very interesting article in the Sunday Times today, uh, which indicates that there's a big dis debate in the ANC about whether or not we should go ahead with the party resolution to, um, to, to extract ourselves or to not be signatories to the ICC any longer. Do you have a view on that? Yes, I have a I have very strong view. I think you know it it will be a sad day if South Africa withdraws from from the International Criminal Court. South Africa is was a strong supporter in setting up the court. We've had a very strong history of support for human rights, and so to withdraw from the court, which is not a perfect entity, but it's the only one we have, will show that that these issues of human rights, these issues of crimes against humanity, genocide, war crimes, and holding people responsible for that is not important to our country. And, and that will be a sad day for us. So I think we need to work within the Rome statute system. It's not a perfect system, but South Africa needs to actually uh, become more vocal and robust in trying to strengthen the system and improve it. And it does need uh, strengthening, it needs improvement. And so I certainly hope that South Africa will never withdraw, but that we will support the International Criminal Justice Project and try to ensure that we can we can strengthen it in a way that makes it more effective. Thank you very much for your clarity. Lots of people offering their services to you. I'm sure that's not new. Um, can they, how, how do we they- We are looking at the donor, I just very quickly on that. You know, we've had yeah. lots of support 
And, you know, we, we uh, particularly in dealing with corruption, and one of the issues has been, you know, we were asked in Parliament, etc., where, you know, people, we want to avoid any kind of, of um, perception that the NPA is now captured and we are now, you know, so uh, re receiving fundings that, that may be an assistance that may yes, have ulterior really objectives. So we are setting up a donor oversight mechanism. Donations, as we've always said, is not new. We've had a lot of donations for, you know, all of government accepts donations, but we're setting up an oversight mechanism because we really do want to, to, to actually uh, accept many of these offers of assistance, particularly when it comes to assisting in dealing with, with corruption. So hopefully there will be um, a lot more you know, people will see that we are, we are moving in that direction. But once we've set up this mechanism to to protect us against any possible attacks in that regard. Thank you. So I wanted to thank you very much for being a good sport, taking all the questions, and especially for especially for doing this Women's Day webinar um, after what sounds to have been a punishingly busy day for you. Thank you very much, Advocate Bato. I hope you enjoy a nice cup of tea. Now. All in a day. This is what thank we're you. here for. Thank you very thank much. You so much. Bye bye. Thank you Bye -bye. to everybody for joining us and to the Conrad Adenauer Foundation for sponsoring this webinar. Have a good evening.